Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In today's video we have my Game Week 37 preview. It's obviously the big double game week, only two game weeks left now as well. And in today's video I'll answer all of your key questions around the double game week about which players to bring in, sell and much, much more. If you do enjoy today's video, please do smash that like button and if you're new around here, make sure to subscribe as well. But without further ado, let's jump into it. So guys, in today's video, we are going to cover a lot of key information ahead of Double Game Week 37, and I'll give you my opinion about the best players to buy and sell in your FPL teams. But I thought a really nice starting point would be this graphic here from Rob T FPL. So Rob makes these graphics every single week, and they are so aesthetically pleasing, but also include a lot of useful information as well. So please do go, do go and follow Rob over on Twitter, X, whatever you'd like to call it, at Rob T FPL. This is not my graphic. I've taken it from him, and I'm sure he will not mind. But yeah, they're very, very useful every week. And the reason that I like these is I can look at non-penalty expected goal involvement, which I'll look at in today's video. And I use that a lot. And I use some other stuff too. But market odds kind of take into account everything. Underlying data, narratives, players that are injured, weather, all sorts of things that we wouldn't necessarily consider. They put that all together and it spits out this information about how many teams we expect, to, how many goals we expect a team to score and what their chances are of a clean sheet. And Rob puts that all together in these very, very nice graphics. So I thought it'd be a really nice starting point for today's video. So as you can see, what we have is the team, their fixtures, total projected goals, and also the chance of getting a clean sheet or one plus clean sheet. Because obviously some teams have two fixtures, some teams will have one. So it's the percentage chance of at least one clean sheet. So there are a few interesting things to note. The first being, in almost any double game week, it doesn't really matter which team, most of the teams that we expect to score lots of goals will be the teams that have two fixtures, right? Because they have two opportunities. So these six teams that are projected to score the most goals in game week 37 are the six teams that are doubling in this order. Man City first with 5.5, then Newcastle with 4.4, then Spurs with 4.18, then we're getting below four goals at this point, Chelsea with 3.85, Man United with 3.03, and then Brighton with 2.88. The team with the the highest projected goals that do not double is unsurprisingly Arsenal against a very weak United defense with 2.6. So definitely, and I would say this is the case most of the time, I would be looking to bring in attackers from teams that double because they have two chances to get those returns. However, and I don't think this happens very often, the clean sheets are actually higher for some of the teams that only have one fixture. And I I say this doesn't happen very often because it's kind of a similar situation where if a team has two games, you would say, well, they've got two chances for a clean sheet. But lots of the teams that double are poor defenses and or have pretty difficult fixtures as well. So definitely the standout team, according to the market odds for a clean sheet is Manchester City, who have a 60% chance of at least one clean sheet. So we'll discuss defenders a little bit later because lots of people have defender issues. If you do have defender injuries and you're not yet on one Man City defender and you've got a spare Man City slot, this looks like a very good chance. It doesn't have to be Gvardio. It could be Walker if you think his minutes will be slightly better, but this would suggest that bringing in a Man City defender makes a lot of sense. After that, we're then looking at Chelsea have a 40% chance for at least one clean sheet. So again, if you're looking for a goalkeeper transfer, someone like a Petrovic could be good. Maybe if you think Gusto will get minutes, and we'll discuss that in a second, he could be a fine transfer. Or someone like a Kukurea could be nice too. But definitely, this when I look at this, I'm like, you know what? Petrovic may well be, maybe alongside Edison, if you want to go there, the best double game week goalkeeper, especially because he'll make some saves as well. This is where it starts to get interesting, though. So after Man City and Chelsea, according to the market odds, the team that are third most likely to keep at least one clean sheet is actually Everton against Sheffield United at home. So you'll see people have been bringing in Branthwaite over recent weeks. Maybe they've got Pickford. This suggests that if you're looking for a clean sheet, Everton, despite only having one fixture, are the third most likely to get a clean sheet. So again, if you're looking at bringing in defenders this week, maybe someone like a Jared Branthwaite isn't the worst idea. After that, you've then got Newcastle. So certainly someone like a Dan Byrne could be a decent shout if we're looking at clean sheet percentage. I don't mind that. And I still think he is probably one of the best value defenders to bring in at the moment. So Branthwaite, then someone like a Byrne. Very, very close in clean sheet percentage there. Then we're actually going on to Arsenal. So again, another team that only have one fixture. And United away, usually in any normal season, you'd say even if they're not playing well, it's not a great fixture from a defensive perspective. But 
based on the way United attacking, based on the way that Arsenal defending, you would say again that there is a decent chance for a clean sheet, especially if Bruno doesn't feature, which again we'll explain or discuss in a little bit more detail later in the video. So Arsenal, definitely a defence that you don't mind having in game week 37. And then we do move on to Spurs with 33%. I think the reason that that's so high, considering one of the games is City, is obviously the other game is Burnley at home. And you would say that despite Spurs not being a great defence, it's certainly not a bad fixture there. The, the other two teams that double that we've not yet mentioned from a defensive perspective is Manchester United and Brighton. Because according to market odds, at the time of Rob making this graphic, Manchester United have a 21% chance for one plus clean sheets, which is very, very low. And then Brighton have a 22%, 22% chance, I should say, for getting at least one clean sheet. So I we're going to discuss against Manchester United and Brighton a little bit later, but this would suggest that you are really not expecting a clean sheet from Manchester United or Brighton. I actually think this might be a little bit harsh on Brighton. I would bump Brighton's odds up slightly, but United, I'd say this is potentially even a bit kind. They are two home fixtures, but Arsenal, and I don't see one which Arsenal and Newcastle don't score. I would go as far as saying it's probably like a 10 to 15% chance. So I did find this very interesting because it paints the picture that we always say, bring in uh, attackers from teams that double. You just get two chances and a lot of these teams have really good assets that you'd want to target. But defensively, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Assuming that you've already got one from City, you've already got one from Newcastle, maybe you look elsewhere from the likes of Everton and Arsenal. So those are the market odds courtesy of Rob TFPL. Let's now move on to some of your other questions. So the next thing that I wanted to discuss ahead of double game week 37 is actually Chelsea assets because there were quite a few questions in particular around Gusto, Kukurea and Jackson. And I do think it's quite a difficult one, really, because you speak to different Chelsea fans. And by the way, fans aren't always the most reliable people to ask, but they obviously watch the most of the games and they have a, a very good idea quite often about the direction that a team will be going in. They've all got very differing opinions, especially around that defence, which makes it very difficult for me to give you any reliable information when even the fans aren't sure. But the situation that we're in right now is that Gusto did get some minutes, I think it was something like seven minutes off the bench in game week 30. Six, let me get my game weeks correct, which means that in any normal situation, you'd say he's been their first choice right back when James has been out. He's actually been very good as well. He's now got minutes. He could conceivably play both games in double game week 37. The issue that we've got is that Kukurea has been absolutely fantastic and he's actually played a slightly different role for Chelsea. Now, I've double checked this with two or three Chelsea fans to make sure that this is correct, but do correct me down below if you think this is incorrect. But essentially what it sounds like they've been doing, because obviously I don't watch Chelsea games in this much detail, is it sounds like Kukurea has been playing an inverted role for Chelsea. So you can see at the moment on the screen, they lined up in a back four in their recent game of Chalaba, Thiago Silva, Badia Shield, and Kukurea. Now, Chalaba's obviously not a right back. So what they're doing is something similar to what Man City have done, where Kukurea slots into midfield in sort of a central defensive midfield role, and they play a back three of Chalaba, Thiago Silva, and Badia Shill. Traditionally, across the rest of the season, they've been playing more like a back four with Gusto at right back and then someone else at left back. So this is a, a bit of a mix up in the kind of approach that they take to the game from a formational and tactical perspective. And it's actually been working incredibly well for Chelsea. And the one thing that people tend to agree on is that Kukurea is playing that role very well. So what happens is Kukurea comes into midfield alongside Caicedo and Gallagher pushes up alongside Palmer. And they basically play with dual tens. So it's like a 3-2-4-1 formation for Chelsea. What that then means is if Chelsea want to stick with this formation and this tactic, if Gusto does play instead of Chalaba, you're playing Gusto as essentially a centre-back, which isn't a position that you would play particularly well. Can he play that? Of course he can. So the first thing to say is he could just slot in where Chalaba played here and play it as a right centre-back with Kukure inverting. The other thing that we could see is actually Kukurea maybe gets rotated, which I wouldn't expect based on his performances recently, but they could play someone like Colwell in Kukurea's position, play Gusto where Chalaber is, and it's actually Gusto that inverts because Gusto could comfortably play that position based on how he is with the ball at his feet. So it could be that they stick with this, but they actually invert from the right side instead of the left, and we've seen Man City do this a little bit in the past. The other final option they've got is they've been off this inversion and they actually just go back to a traditional back four where it's Gusto at right back and Kukurea at left back. I don't know which of these is going to happen, but I would say based on how good they've been recently, it would be pretty bonkers to now just completely remove this system. And I also think it would be pretty crazy to just all of a sudden just bench Kukurea based on how well he's been playing. So I think what is more likely is that Gusto's minutes probably aren't going to be fantastic in this double. But I could be completely off. Based on how good he has been at points this season, I would not be surprised to see him 
to see Pochettino find a way to get Gusto into the starting eleven. But I definitely don't think you've got like a really high likelihood, especially given that he's just come back from injury, that he starts both in the double. My current prediction is that he starts one, but I would actually say there is a greater chance that Gusto starts neither than starts both. And that is currently the way that I'm perceiving this. But let's see if we get some updated info throughout the week, because it could completely change based on injuries, based on what we hear in press conferences as well. So that's sort of the defensive situation that we've got at the moment. So I think Kukure is a really nice shout for this double game week. And I'm starting to think more and more so that Gusto is not. So there are a lot of people, myself included, that are sat there right now and their three Chelsea assets are Petrovic, Gusto and Palmer. So the question then comes, would you sell Gusto if it's the only way to get Jackson, even if it was free hit? So maybe you've got a front three, again, similar to me, where you've got Jao Pedro, Isaac, and Haaland. And you're thinking, do I sell both Gusto and Jao Pedro or Gusto and Hoyland, for example, to bring in another defender and Jackson? My simple answer to this is if you can do that for a minus four in total, I would do it i.e. if one of your free transfers is to remove Gusto and then you take a single hit to bring in Jackson for one of the forwards, then yes, I really, really like that because Jackson looks incredibly good and I don't think Gusto starts both in the double. The more difficult situation, again, if we go back to my team as an example, I have to use my free transfer to remove Fabian share, right? Because it looks like he'll be out for the season. At least it doesn't look very likely that he'll play both in 37. So if I'm using my one free transfer, transfer to remove Fabian share, I'm then going to have to take two hits to remove Gusto and to bring in Jackson. So it's not a minus four here. It's, it's an eight point hit to switch Gusto to Jackson and to remove Jao Pedro and Gusto. So in that situation, I think it's borderline because if Gusto does start one and he gets a clean sheet or he gets an attacking return and he picks up like six to eight points across the double. And let's say Jao Pedro doesn't have a particularly good double, but only picks up one return, maybe an assist or a goal, a couple of appearance points too. You'd need Jackson to really go big and your defenders do fairly well for it to even just kind of half pay back that hit. So I'm a, I'm a little bit more hesitant to say yes if it's for a minus eight. But if you was to ask me in isolation, is Jackson and a defender of your choice, could be even a Kukurea, no, it wouldn't be able to be Kukurea unless you've not got Palmer, let's say, or Petrovic, let's say it's a defender of your choice like Burn plus Jackson versus Gusto and Jao Petro, well then yeah, that is a much better combination. It could comfortably outscore them by eight points. So... I'm not going to give you a definitive answer, sadly, for the minus eight. For the minus four, I would do it. Let's say you've got no other issues to sort out and you can switch Gusto to Jackson for a minus four. Absolutely. For a minus eight, in a single week, could that pay back eight points? Of course it could. But am I confident that it would? I'm less so. But definitely, if you are choosing a fresh now, the three best uh, Chelsea assets to own for me would probably be Petrovic, Palmer, Jackson. But I do quite like Kukurea, Palmer, and Jackson. I would probably have at least one Chelsea defender. And this goes back to the discussion that we were having around the market odds as well. The market odds are kind of in favor of a Chelsea clean sheet here in comparison to some of the others. others. So I do like having one of Petrich or Kukurea, having Palmer, and then probably having Jackson in an ideal world. I think there is a good chance that I don't go into 37 with Jackson though which I'm not feeling very confident about. I'd love to know down below in the comments, what do you think about that Chelsea discussion? I'm not a Chelsea fan, so take it with a slight pinch of salt. And also, which three Chelsea assets, assuming you have three, will you be going into double game at 37 with? So another team that I think we need to talk about is actually Manchester United, because they have been awful recently. Not even recently, across the season, they have been absolutely woeful. And lots of people were either maybe planning a transfer to bring them in, or probably more likely now, because most people aren't looking to bring them in, is you've got one or two United assets. Do you genuinely just take hits to remove them? So some of the questions we had was, is it worth taking out United players such as Hoyland and Garnacho for a minus four? So using a hit to remove United attackers despite them doubling, maybe even for single singlers like a Bakayo Saka or a Havertz. And is it also worth selling someone like a Diogo Dallo for a minus four despite, sorry, due to Manchester United being absolutely horrendous? And I kept that question in because yes, they are absolutely horrendous. So I've not gone into like loads of detail on the data, but what you can see on your screen is Manchester United's non-penalty expected goals per 90. So they're attacking threat across the season and across the last six. And then I've got their non-penalty expected goals conceded across the season and across the last six as well. To give you a bit of an idea about are they being even more horrendous recently than across the season, or is it kind of what we've seen throughout the year? I actually thought it was really interesting. There was a tweet from XG Philosophy, if you follow them over on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it. It is X, I know, but I just can't not call it Twitter. And they basically showed, and this was from a few weeks ago, and since then, I think we've actually been significantly worse. But what they showed is that Manchester United, based on expected points, should probably be somewhere around 16th or 17th. So based on combining goal threat 
and the way that they've defended across the season, Manchester United deserve without obviously some great saves from Onana and some creative brilliance from Bruno, maybe. We deserve to be right down there as a potential relegation threat. So this is not a good team, and it's not something that is specific to recent weeks. It's across the season as well. Before I actually look at the data in a bit more detail and discuss some of these questions, I do just want to make it very clear that it doesn't really matter if Manchester United are bad as a team, especially for the attackers. And the example I will give is Bruno. In recent weeks, he has been just getting so many points. I mean, it's just been ridiculous. And his data is still very strong. And Garnacho also, like, I remember Garnacho only a few weeks ago getting me a 14-pointer. You don't need United to do well for these players to do well. If they only score two goals across the double, but Garnacho scores both of them, then he's a great FPO asset, right? So I do think there is a distinction that needs to be made between the, the team as a whole and whether you want that player as an FPO asset. But obviously, in general, if a team aren't creating many chances, such as, like, let's say, Brighton, well, then João Pedro hasn't been a good option because Brighton aren't creating. I think where it's more of an issue is defensively, because if a team is conceding lots of chances, well, then you lose the chance for a clean sheet. I was actually really surprised when I looked into the data. Manchester United across the last six, and they have had some favourable fixtures in there, I will admit that, but they've actually been better data-wise, across the last six and a half across the season. So across the season, Manchester United are the 13th best defence, so they're in the bottom half of the table for expected non-penalty expected goals per 90. So very much a mid-table team for goal threat. And I think that's fine from an FPL perspective. We regularly invest in teams that are not in the top half of the table for attacking assets. So that doesn't worry me overly. And across the last six, we're actually eighth for non-penalty expected goals. And I know that we've not been converting those, and that is an issue in and of itself. But that doesn't worry me overly. So the attacking data has actually improved. Again, some favorable fixtures, but actually improved slightly across the last six. Across the season, we are 16th for non-penalty expected goals per 90. So a very, 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 very bad defense. Across the last six, slightly improved, but still in the bottom half of the table. So I guess the, the important thing here is that we aren't much worse now than we have been across the season. So I don't think you should look at it and go, based on how terrible United have been recently, do you, well, no, they've been terrible across the season, actually across the last six, slightly better. And I know eye test wise, it has been appalling recently. And I guess if you've watched the games, it does look like there's an even further drop off recently. But I guess my point would be, if you invested in United assets five or six weeks ago, they've not got much worse. <laughs> I guess it's a silver lining look at this. Now, I think the, the key take home outside of that is this is not a very good defense. And the two fixtures in double game week 37 are against Arsenal and Newcastle, who are two very, very good attacks. So straight away, yes, I would sell Manchester United assets. And to be honest, I would be tempted to do it for a minus four. If you've got a free transfer to do something like Dallow to Burn or Dallow to even a Gabriel, potentially, I would honestly be very tempted to do it. In fact, I would probably suggest that you do make that transfer. But even for a minus four, maybe, genuinely, especially if it's to get like a Gavardi in, I would bet, should I? I? I would be very, 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 very surprised if Gavardi doesn't outscore Dallo by four points in game 37 and 38, and probably even just in 37. So yeah, starting with the defense, I would absolutely be willing to take someone like Dallo out for a minus four. When we come to Onana, I find this a little bit more difficult because Onana can make a lot of save points and maybe even still pick up bonus despite conceding, whereas Dallow would need to get an attacking return. And I think it's much more likely that Onana makes a bunch of saves than Dallow gets an attacking return. So I would be hesitant to take out Onana for a hit or even for free because I don't look at many game week 37 goalkeepers as being much better options than Onana. And if United do miraculously somehow keep a clean sheet, Onana is getting you like 14, 15 points because you'd have to make so many saves to make that happen. So I feel slightly better about keeping Onada than I would a Dallow. For the attackers, I find this slightly more difficult because I do think it... My my answer to this will revolve around whether Bruno's fit. And I'm recording this without knowing Bruno's injury status. If Bruno's fit, I wouldn't take them out. And the reason I say that is Newcastle have been susceptible to conceded chances. And I know Arsenal are absolutely fantastic. But in a game of that magnitude, could United get one chance and take it? They could. And I think with Manchester United... A lot of their goals are concentrated on very few players. Garnacho and Bruno, you'd think there is a very good chance if they are fit and available that they are involved in those goals. So I think I would be willing to take the chance and just keep them rather than take a hit to remove them. Hoyland is more difficult because Hoyland just isn't getting any chances. Manchester United are not set up in a way to feed Hoyland. He very rarely takes shots. I mean, if, if at all, you'll, you'll see games go by two or three games at a time. He's taken like one shot. So... 
on Hoyland, I would be willing to take a minus four to remove Hoyland for someone like a Callum Wilson or a Nicholas Jackson. I think that could be a nice transfer. But for Garnacho and Bruno, assuming Bruno's available, I would be hesitant to take them out for a hit. For free, feel free to go for it. I don't hate that at all. But for a minus four, I'm less sure. If Bruno is a doubt or ruled out, then of course feel free to sell Bruno. And I think that gives you the green light to remove Garnacho potentially for a hit as well. Because without Bruno, who's creating chances for this Manchester United attack? It not only makes the Arsenal Newcastle defences so much better, but it makes the lots of Hoyland and Garnacho completely redundant as options because they're just not going to get that service. So to recap my opinion on this, Manchester United are awful, but not, they have not been any more awful recently than what we've seen across the season. Regardless of what happens with injuries and stuff, I just think Manchester United defence are awful investments, but I would probably keep Onana. I'd be willing to sell Dallow and of course sell Maguire because he's injured. And for the attackers, Hoyland, I'd be willing to sell because we are just not set up in a way to create for him. And Garnacho and Bruno are completely dependent around Bruno's fitness. If Bruno's available, I would keep them. If Bruno's a major doubt or ruled out, I'd be willing to sell both for a hit. So there we go. That is my hopefully non-biased opinion around Manchester United. I'd love to know down below, Gunn is 37 based on your transfers, are you likely to actually own any Man United players? So the next major talking point ahead of Game Week 37 is differential options. Lots of us chasing in ranking mini leagues. I'm currently 52k and behind in a lot of mini leagues myself. So I'm currently weighing up whether it's worth chasing. And so we want some differential options. And maybe even if you're not chasing, you're just really trying to reach the best rank you can. And you think, do you know what? I'm willing to take a risk with a lowly owned asset. Are there any players that are currently very lowly owned that probably will be that way going into Game Week 37? that might be worth bringing in. And I always want to caveat this, and I feel like I shouldn't have to say this, but it's a kind of obvious point that sometimes we forget. If a player is differential, it is due to one of two reasons or potentially both. They either have really bad data and really bad returns, that being, right, they don't look like they're a particularly good option, and or they have really bad expected minutes. So before you comment down below, this player is terrible because they have bad minutes or bad data, Obviously, otherwise they wouldn't be a differential, right? Because if a player has really good underlying data, good returns and good expected minutes, then they're just not going to be a differential. Everyone's going to want to bring them in. Some of these are obviously slightly bigger differentials than others. And I'm not necessarily saying that you go out there and bring loads of these in. But here are some of the options that I would maybe be looking to bring in for 37 if you're looking to chase a little bit. And I'm recording this just to timestamp this on Wednesday evening, ready for a Thursday morning upload, because there are rumors going around about lots of different players. Lots of the players on here are injury prone as well. So if I'm discussing a player that ends up picking up an injury, I'm sorry. And you can obviously just ignore that part for, uh, of the section. So starting with Livramento, I've got him in here, but apparently Kieran Trippier is now back in full team training. Whether he starts both in a double, I would be surprised. I think Trippier will only get one start probably, which would be the Man United game. Even if he does start both, I do think Livramento could potentially start both as well. Because the other option they've got is playing Lewis Hall, who actually recently has been slightly better, but across the season hasn't been someone necessary that Eddie Howe has trusted massively. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Trippier right back, Livramento left back. Or what is probably more likely is the first game will be Livramento right back, Lewis Hall left back. And then in the second game, when Kieran Trippier gets to start, he's basically got a decision around whether he plays Livramento or Hall. So I think one of Livramento and Hall probably starts both. It's up to you to choose who you think that is. I just think Livramento is a slightly more attacking player. And I also think he's a slightly more... I don't want to say talented, but I back him more so to get an attacking return than Hall. So I, I like both of them. Whoever starts both in 37 will be a really nice option. And Livramento's data recently has been even better than across the season because across the season, it's actually not been that fantastic. So I like Livramento as a cheap option, but Dan Byrne is definitely the safer one if you need a Newcastle defender. The next option is actually Kukurea. And I spoke about him in a lot of detail in the Chelsea section. So if you haven't watched that and you've just skipped to this section, go back and watch the Chelsea section. But I think there is a very good chance he starts both in the double, definitely more so than someone like Amalo Gusto. So if you're looking for a cheeky option and Chelsea do have a decent chance for a clean sheet, I really like Kukurea. His minutes have been very secure recently. His data isn't great because he's inverting into left defensive midfield. So he's not really playing this like overlapping attacking left back role. But he's okay for bonus points when he doesn't get booked and sent off and scores own goals as well. And I just like the fact that I think Chelsea are probably one of the better teams for clean sheets odds in this double. So Kukurea, I do think, is a really nice option. But I wouldn't necessarily expect him to go out there and get you like 30 points. But you never know. We saw what happened with Ben White in double game week 34. So Kukurea and Livermento would be up there as two of my favorite options. We'll discuss defenders a bit later. I do really like the Brighton defenders. Some like a Veltman or a Webster or a Dunk. But I don't think they're as differential. And I also don't think they're as... The upside is as high as it is with Livramento and Kukurea. When we move on to the midfield, I mean, we've got some really decent cheaper options. Most of these options are pretty cheap. 
Let's start with the Brighton midfielders. You can see here Adingra and Gross are on this list. The issue with Adingra and Gross is their data is so, so bad. But like I said, otherwise they wouldn't be differential, right? But Adingra definitely passes the eye test. Whenever you watch Brighton, you feel like he's got a very good chance to get an attacking return. He would be up there as probably one of my favorite differentials because his minutes seem relatively secure. He does get the early sub from time to time, as you can see here, but... I think his starting minutes seem to be pretty secure. And I just think he's got that flair and that ability to go out there and get you a big haul. So I like Adingra, but the data doesn't support him as a great option. Pascal Gross's data is slightly better across the season. His minutes are definitely more secure. And do remember that in game week 36, Jao Pedro missed a penalty. And Gross will take penalties even when Jao Pedro is not on the pitch. So if he also gets penalties when JP is on the pitch now, well then Pascal Gross is probably the best option on this list because with penalties chucked in as well, he is really, really good for, for bonus points. So he gets one return. He's Even if he gets booked, he's usually good for two or three bonus. So I would have Pascal Gross up there just due to his minutes, the fact that he might be on pens, and he's definitely on pens when JP isn't on the pitch. He's on some set pieces too. He's got lots of routes to points, Pascal Gross. So whilst he's playing a, a relatively defensive role at the moment, you could definitely do worse than him in the double. So I like a dinger and Gross, but yeah, the data's not great for either of them. Madweke and Gallagher... You've got a kind of similar situation where the data isn't fantastic, but Madweke's is slightly better. So across the season, 0.38, which is okay. But across the last six, it's up at 0.46. So Madweke's data in recent weeks has been very good. And his minutes have also been slightly more secure too. I think he's started quite a few in a row now. And so I like him as an option. Very little to say that, that I don't like other than I don't think he's fully nailed on. And if he did get benched in one in the double, I wouldn't be overly surprised. I'd love to know down below, Chelsea fans, if you think he's fully nailed on. I, I, it, this could be awfully wrong, but I think Mudrick is more likely to be the one that is subbed off if one of the attackers doesn't start than Mad, Madweke. But I think both of them have been pretty good recently. So I could be awfully wrong on that one. But I do really like him just due to the fact that his data is reasonably good. And again, if you watch, it's kind of a similar situation to a Dingra. You just feel like you could get some good returns from it. And actually, Madweke has had the returns to go along with those performances in recent weeks. Gallagher's data across the season and the last six has been really bad. But what you get with Gallagher is his minutes are so good. 89 minutes per uh, per game over the last six. So, Mad, uh, sorry, Gallagher's uh, minutes are definitely better than Madweke's. But his data is a lot, lot weaker. So, I mean, with those four options, Adingra, Madweke, Gallagher and Gross... None of them stand out as particularly fantastic. But again, we're looking at differentials here. I'd probably say Madweke and Adinga would be up there for me, but their minutes are less secure than Gallagher and Gross. So it's up to you whether you want to chase the minutes or you want to chase the upside with like, who's a slightly more exciting pick, I suppose. We then move on to some slightly more expensive options. I've got Bernardo Silva here because actually his data across the season in the last six is better than we've seen in recent years. So his data is exactly the same as Pascal Gross across the season, non-penalty expected goal involvement. But in the last six, it's actually shot up to 0.48. So we're not talking about mind-blowing data here, but could you see in this double Bernardo starting both and outscoring like KDB and Foden? It's just a very double game week thing to happen. So I don't think Bernardo is better than Foden. I don't think he's better than KDB. He's not better than Haaland or Guardiola. So Bernardo Silver is definitely not in the top three Man City assets. But if you do have a spare City slot open, you're like, I don't need a defender. I can't afford KDB, but I do have a spare slot in midfield at that price. You could do a lot worse than Bernardo Silva. But if I had to predict, I think he probably only starts one. I said that, though, I think in the previous double, and I think he started both. And he does often start quite a few games in quick succession. And he's definitely in Man City's best starting eleven. So he will get early subs. There is a chance he doesn't start both. But I also don't think Bernardo Silva is a horrible option if you've got a third City slot open. And like I said, you can't move to a defender and you can't afford KDB. Bernardo Silva could be an okay option. I think we then move on to probably my three favorite differentials, though. And definitely my favorite two differentials that double in 37, which is Richarlison and Wilson. Because both of them have exceptionally strong data across the season. And whenever they play, they always get a lot of big chances. And most of their non-penalty expected goal involvement is made up through expected goals, which is what we love. We want our players that we're bringing in to get us goals rather than assists because you get more points. And you're more likely to pick up bonus as well. Richarlison is my favorite differential, and I, I say he's a differential because at the moment he's only owned by a few percent. I do expect that to shoot up because lots of people are talking about him this week, but he's still only going to be a maximum of like 30 to 40 percent. I can't see him rising above that around your ranks, and I think most people in your mini leagues are probably fairly happy with their midfield, so he might not even be that highly owned in your mini league. So I just see him as having such incredibly high upside. He is the type of player that can easily go out there and get you a brace. And yes, one of the games is against City, but 
I wouldn't say it's out of the question that they score against City. And against Burnley, you would expect them to put two or three goals past them. Because whilst Burnley have improved in recent weeks, they are still shipping a lot of goals. So I just look like, look at this as such a high upside pick. Now, the issue with Richarlison, I don't think you see data. And in all honesty, I don't think many people are questioning his, his ability to score goals now. It's his minutes. Because we've been saying since he come back from injury that he's going to start and he's just not starting. But based on his performance off the bench against Liverpool, unless there is something going on that we don't know about, I don't see his Postacoglu can see that performance off the bench and go, yeah, I'm going to bench for Charleston again. I think he's got to start. And I think if he is benching a fixture, it's going to be the Man City game. So I think what you're probably going to get worst case with Richarlison, not worst case, I should say, but in my opinion, worst case, would be a start against Burnley, a bench against City, and then a start against Sheffield United, which should in all honesty be absolutely fine. So I'm really looking at targeting those two fixtures against Burnley and Sheffield United. His data has dropped off slightly in the last six, but he's barely played any minutes, and it's very consistent across the season. The only thing I would note is when we said he was like an elite option, it was when Son wasn't available as he was at the Asian Cup and then I think injured. So Richarlison was on penalties. He's not on penalties now. Sonny will be on penalties. But he is playing as the number nine and he does have outrageously good goal threats. So you'll hear a lot of people talk about Richarlison this week. If Bruno is out or you've got a free midfield slot, I just see Richarlison as such a good option. I am even considering doing a minus four of Garnacho to Richarlison because I think Richarlison is that good of an option for game week 37. The other option that I really like is Callum Wilson. And again, you'll see people talk about Wilson this week, but I can almost guarantee you he's not going to be above 10% owned. The reason for that is a massive injury risk, which is a big threat. His minutes have not been overly secure. There's a very good chance he doesn't start two of the next three and he only starts one. And so for, I think for all of those reasons, and also lots of people don't have a free slot in, in the forward spot. And if they do, they're probably going for Jackson. I just don't see many people owning Wilson. And if you remember last season in double game week 36, I think it was, everyone piled in on Isaac. And I think Wilson went big. He got something like two or three, maybe even four attacking returns. And he had an absolute monster score. So Wilson is just ridiculous. When you look at his data, not only this year, but in recent years as well, whenever he plays, he is a big chance magnet but the difference between like a Wilson and maybe say someone like a Darwin, Wilson is genuinely a brilliant finisher. He will finish the chances that he gets. And if you look at his points per 90 over the last two or three seasons, it's just a joke. And even his data here, look, he's got the best data on this list at 0.73 non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90. And since coming back, very, very small sample size, but it's at 1.28. That's non-penalty. Now, I actually thought he would be on penalties when both Isaac and Wilson were on the pitch because that's what happened last season. We expected Wilson to, to take penalties. But in the recent game, Isaac took the penalty when Wilson was on the pitch. Now, I don't think that will be the case probably anymore given that Isaac missed it. So maybe the situation that we'll see now is actually Wilson is on penalties. And obviously there could be a position where... Wilson's on the pitch and Isaac isn't, and then he's definitely going to be on penalty. So you've got like a maybe half penalty taker with outrageous data, okay fixtures, and he's a brilliant finisher too, and he's going to be very lowly owned. Wilson is the ultimate differential rank chasing, mini league chasing transfer. But I will acknowledge that I think he only starts one in double game at 37. And also he could start and get injured after 10 minutes. He could even get no minutes. There are rumours, and they're very weak rumours at the moment, that he might even have a hamstring injury, but it's not been supported by anything. Therefore, I'm not going to discuss it here. We'll look at that maybe later in the week. He was pitching in some form of training on Wednesday, but it, you just wouldn't be surprised if you transfer him in. It looks like a great option. He doesn't get any minutes in the double, right? He's that sort of player. So it's a massive risk, but it's such a high upside pick that I would be tempted to go for it if you're chasing. The only other option that I've not considered here before we move on, because I've spent a long time talking about differentials, is Erdegaard. I'll chuck Havertz in there as well. I just think Havertz is slightly higher owned than Erdegaard. Basically, an Arsenal attacker, because even Saka's down at like 30% owned at my rank. They're playing one of the worst defences in the league against Manchester United. They've then got a home game in 38 could you see Arsenal putting three, four, five goals past Man United? Even more than that, yes. And will they score a couple of goals at least in Game Week 38? You'd expect so. And it doesn't look like the league will be wrapped up either way by Game Week 38. So I'm probably predicting five or six goals for Arsenal across the next two fixtures. Are there any other teams that I would expect to score or comfortably predict will score six plus goals across the next two game weeks? Maybe a few, but the Arsenal assets could be really good shouts. So Erdegaard's data has actually been incredibly strong recently. You can see here, 0.58 non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90. He's been very unlucky not to get more attacking returns, especially in game week 36, who's very unfortunate. So 
I really like a punt on Erdegaard or Havertz alongside even a Bukayo Saka, despite the fact that they don't double. And again, that's a very rank chasing thing because not many other people are going to be looking to bring in Arsenal attackers this week when you've got other doublers to choose from. So I'll leave it there because that's a very long section on differentials. Those would be some of my favourite options. I think from this list, it really is Richarlison, Wilson, Erdegaard up there for me. But I don't mind a cheeky punt on a Dedingra, Madweke, Gallagher and Gross are okay. And then defensively, I think Kukurea would be up there as my favourite shout in defence. So guys, we spoke about defenders throughout the video and actually I've included a very similar graphic in my last two videos. Now, don't you think guys, I think I'm starting to get lazy and just repeating the same graphics. It's just because the questions keep coming up. So I'm literally going to spend like two seconds here. It'll probably be like 10 minutes of no me, but I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about defenders. If you're just done with defenders, just skip to the next section because there is a section after this. But still, Cavani always the best defender for me, hands down, comfortably. Attacking threat, looks good for minutes. Clean sheet odds are up there comfortably is better than it, the rest of the other defenders. So Guardiol for me is definitely the best defender to bring in this week. After that, it is still Gabriel and White. Arsenal's clean sheet percentage chance is very high this week. They are the best defense in the league. They've got attacking threat. They've got a great fixture in 38. For me, Arsenal defense is still worth considering transfers in. Maybe not for a hit because they've only got the one fixture, but if you've got a free transfer, I don't mind it. And I definitely wouldn't be removing them. After that, I think Dan Byrne is in fourth still because the chance for a clean sheet is there. He's got a bit of attacking threat. He's okay for bonus and he's very, very cheap. So Dan Byrne is definitely a good shout. Pedro Porro may be controversially up there for, in fifth now. And the reason that he's gone up is he's got Burnley and Sheffield United in the next two game weeks. Yes, the fixture against City could be minus points, but he's got attacking threat. He's not playing the best defense, but he's got two very good fixtures coming up. And I just think when not many teams keep clean sheets, go for the attacking threat. And he's on set pieces. He's good for bonus points too. You could definitely do a lot worse than Pedro Porro. Very expensive, but I'm probably looking at bringing in Porro myself this week. Walker is in sixth. And I know that seems very harsh, but I just think Guardiola's got the attacking threat that Walker doesn't necessarily have in abundance. And so I think Vardy always definitely clear of Walker for me, unless you're going for a slightly more differential pick, because at the moment, more people own Vardy than they do Walker. So maybe if you're willing to risk it, going for a Carl Walker could be okay. And if Vardy does get benched in one and Walker starts both, you could be laughing. I do have Kukurea up there in seventh. We've discussed him in enough detail. I love him. And, and Livramento in eighth. But it does depend largely around how you think his minutes will go. Do you think Trippier starts in game 37? And if he does, is it Livramento or Hall at left back? I've then got Veltman and Webster. I think the minutes that they've got recently, and based on the other injuries that Brighton have, whilst I don't think Brighton are a great team for clean sheet potential in 37 or 38, they've got a chance. Also, they carry a bit of attacking threat, Veltman and Webster. And actually, Veltman and Webster have been pretty good for bonus points in recent years too. So I like these two as options. When there aren't many other good options to choose from, and maybe you've tripled up on some of the other teams, you could definitely do worse at a cheap price than Veltman and Webster. So I really don't mind those two. And I think both of them should start both in double game week 37. If you are a Brighton fan and you disagree, please let me know down below. I've got Regalon in 11th because, yes, only a single fixture, but he's up there with some of the others that okay chance for a clean sheet but more importantly he's had some really good attacking threat in recent weeks and months as well so you could definitely do worse than Regalon got the set pieces got the open play creative threat as well and he's okay for bonus points as well even if he doesn't necessarily get you an attacking return and then in 12th I've got Branthwaite maybe slightly harsh Upon reflection, Branthwaite probably deserves to be higher than this. I just, I'm struggling to get on board with Branthwaite because the data doesn't suggest that he's great for attacking returns, but he's good for bonus points. And as we saw in the market odds section, very good chance for a clean sheet this week. So maybe upon reflection, Branthwaite should be higher. But if you go for one or two defenders from this 12 with your transfers, I think they're all fine options. It really depends on your team, your structure, and where you've got a free slot uh, with respect to teams and triple ups, I think. So guys, we'll finish up with a discussion around free hits because there are still quite a few people that have their free hit left and they're looking to use it this week. And I do really like it because I think there is some fun that you can definitely be having. I didn't think it deserved an entire video just because there is probably, it's probably only like 10 to 15% of you actually on free hit. So I thought I'd at least include a section in this video on free hit. And what I've done is I've got two different drafts here. One draft, which is the one on the left-hand side of the graphic, is the best team on paper, according to me. So if I was to just try and build the best team possible, not worrying about rank, not worrying about ownership, literally just looking at the players in isolation, that's the one I would go for. But then I've built a second draft, which is if you are chasing in your mini league or you're chasing rank and you want to go with lots of differentials. I will just acknowledge that that team probably has too many risks, like it I've still got some players like Palmer in there, but you don't need to take tons of risks 
for it to be a brilliant free hit for you. Look at Game Week 34. My free hit wasn't too dissimilar to a lot of other people that didn't free hit, but I had like Mateta, Ben White, and a couple of other players, and it ended up going absolutely massive. So you only need to differentiate in like three or four spots and just have those come in. Unless you're talking like you are chasing like 110 points or something, and you just need to go super different. But even then, I still think you can get away with not going completely different. So there's probably a middle ground to be had between the two if you're chasing. But the one on the left, the team is Verbruggen, just in case you're listening rather than watching. Verbruggen, Porro, Gvardiol, Burn, Son, Foden, Palmer, Richarlison, Haaland, Isaac, Jackson. It looks super template and it looks like a lot of people that have just wildcarded. And that's because they've just wildcarded, right? They could basically build a team towards this double. But there are a few key things. I, I like the idea of having Pedro, Porro, Son and Richarlison. I think I would have the three of them because of that Burnley at home game. And I would have Richarlison in there instead of a Bruno Fernandes, instead of a Gordon, because I think he has the upside. And he's at least one slightly differential option if you are still wanting to try and gain a little bit. But I think I like those. I would have three City. And I still think Vardy, Old Foden and Haaland are the three best City. So those are in there for that reason. I think Dan Byrne and Isaac are really good value options for Game Week 37. So they'd be in there. Jackson and Palmer, really nice as well. Don't see any reason not to go for them. I've then got Verbruggen rather than Petrovic. But that's because I wanted Kukurea on the bench in case I needed him. But you could just go for like Duncan Petrovic if you wanted to. Probably a slightly greater chance for a clean sheet for Petrovic than Bebrugan. So it's really up to you in that goalkeeper spot who you go for. But that is kind of a very good, solid free hit foundation. If you want to differentiate from there, going for a KDB instead of a Guardiol, you absolutely can. I just think this combination of players for me is probably the best team that you can build for 37. On the right-hand side, I've just differentiated in some places. I've gone for double Spurs defense just in the hope that you might get a clean sheet against that burn in that Burnley game. And if you do, well, then you're in a very, very good position. I've also dropped Son because, yes, yeah, Son is on penalties and it is Son. But Son's not been brilliant in recent weeks. I'm not saying he's been bad, but could you go for like a Brennan Johnson or a Richarlison and double Spurs defense rather than Son? That is an, an awful place to differentiate. Brennan Johnson and Richards have been very good in recent weeks. So you could you could certainly differentiate in that spot away from Son there. Where else have I gone different? I've gone for Walker, Foden, De Bruyne rather than Gvardio, Foden, Haaland. So rather than Gvardio and Haaland, you've got Walker and KDB. Do I suggest you make both of those? Maybe not. But could you go for KDB instead of Haaland? I mean, it didn't go very well last week if you did that, but you could take that risk. And Walker instead of Gvardio, I mean, it's a 50-50. You just never know in a, in a, in a single week who's going to get more points. So it's kind of what I've just done there. And and the other, I, I guess the key standout here is because I've got no Haaland, I can put Wilson in that spot. And I, I really like Wilson. I would probably suggest you go for Wilson instead of Jackson rather than Wilson instead of Haaland. But if you're really chasing, it's not awful. And that would therefore mean you have to go for a different captaincy options to Haaland. So, I mean, like I said, that, that right-hand draft is, is really, really different. You don't need to go that different. But there are some really nice picks in there where you can differentiate. You don't feel like you've got to go super, super template if you're chasing or you want to have some fun with it. So there are some common commonalities there. There are certain players that I think you obviously know you want. But triple City, double or triple Spurs, double or triple Chelsea, double or triple Newcastle. And then you fill in the assets in and around that. And I think you've got yourself a very solid free hit draft. So guys, there you have it. That is my double game week 37 preview. It's a very long one, but there was a lot to discuss. And if you do enjoy these preview videos and you enjoyed today's one, please do smash that like button. Let's aim for 1500 likes on today's video. And also make sure to subscribe. If you've watched to this point and you're not yet subscribed, I would really appreciate it. Until next time, thank you very much. Bye-bye.